Welcome to the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. I'm your host, Chris Kulmer, and in this podcast, as always, we explore the unique world of international schooling and music education by speaking with professionals working around the globe. International schooling can be an exciting space to work in. So to start this episode, I wanted to mention our nine MTIIS community principles that you can find in the about section of the website. The principles are all based around the idea that the MTIS is a future focused community oriented organization. And since international schools are often unique sites for testing new innovations and ideas in music education, our nine community principles kind of reflect this. So I'm going to outline two of these today, which I think might even connect to the interview that you're going to hear. The first one is the first principle is music making is deeply connected to community building within both the school and surrounding communities. We actively promote the participatory nature of music. So that's principle one. So keep that one marinating in your mind. Number two is we can leverage our role as the artistic face of the school in collaboration with the other art forms to reflect the historical place of the arts as the expressive heart of community. I really like that one. Over the next couple of months, I'm going to expand on these principles through a series of articles in LinkedIn, and you can check those out over there. Okay, so on to today's episode. I'm excited to be speaking with Ivan Lodemel, the head of high school music at the United World College Southeast Asia East Campus. I first met Ivan during one of our conversations with Samuel Wright. And Ivan and Samuel entered this deep discussion on music technology pathways, and I loved it. And I knew I needed to get Ivan on the show to explore this a bit more. What I didn't know were the other fascinating areas that Ivan is working in, especially around service learning. So let's get into it. Ivan, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's really great to see someone really pushing to sort of bring all international school teachers uh, in music together. It's the, the first time we've ever had this kind of thing. So really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thanks. And I think I love to start lots of podcasts like this because it is all about connection and getting to know what people are doing in this space as an exciting space. So can you start off, Ivan, telling us a bit about your background uh, as a musician, maybe, and also as a music educator? Yeah, it's a long story, of course. I'm going to try to keep it uh, concise. But uh, I, st- uh, I grew up in a really small town in Norway. It's about 800 people there. I and mean, I was very interested in music uh, all the way through. And I started playing Norwegian folk music when I was about eight years old. Um, and then eventually sort of started uh, steering into things like jazz and jazz piano, and that became something that I really pursued. Uh, but one of the interesting things about growing up in such a small place is that there weren't that many musicians, but the people that were into it were, were very enthusiastic. So you had to kind of do all the different things. So I would play a little bit of bass in this, I'd play a little bit of trombone in the local brass band, and so it became this kind of eclectic sort of music experience, I guess. So that was the beginning of it. So when I was uh, 17, I applied for a scholarship to the United World Colleges. And so that ended up with me becoming a student at the school that I now work um, in Singapore. Uh, That was obviously a big change from the the small town of 800 people to Singapore um, and, you know, living in boarding school and that kind of thing. So um, that was the the beginning of my my journey in sort of international education, I guess. And then I went into jazz and I studied jazz performance at Trinity College of Music in London. And then uh, worked as a musician full time for quite a few years after that. But more and more, I, I got excited about doing things around education. I felt a lot of purpose and a lot of meaning in that kind of work and decided to go back to school and, and train to, to become a teacher. And then quite quickly after, after a year in, in, uh, in the UK, I went into the world of international teaching. So I was first in Bangladesh and then uh, I came here to, to back to UWC SEA and where I'm now a teacher after. So going full circle from student to teacher. And my, my daughter will start here next year. So that's another another step on that <laughs> on that, that journey. So uh, I didn't expect that. And I'd love to dig a bit more into the coming back to international schooling thing. So you did your training in the UK. Did I get that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And then what led you to think I'm going to go into international schooling and maybe even why Bangladesh? Yeah, so uh, I mean, the, the, um, 
as as many people know, I think you know when you want to get into international teaching, you have to have some flexibility with the, and being you know able to go wherever you, the the journey takes you. Um, so when I trained to be a teacher, when I went back to to school to become a teacher, I I knew that this was a world that I that I wanted to be in. I mean, having been a student in the international school and kind of knowing what that was and what that experience was like for teachers and students. I, it was something I wanted to do. And then I went to one of those job fairs, and as it happened, Bangladesh was uh, was on the menu, and <laughs> and I went, and I was really glad that I did, because those three years were were really quite an incredible experience, and I loved my my work there. And I worked at the International School Dhaka, ISD, uh, and that was uh, that was a really wonderful time, and I learned I learned a lot about a lot of things when I when I was there. So three years in Bangladesh, then how long in Singapore now? So since two thousand and twelve. So that's uh, I guess the. Uh, 11th year or whatever now. Yeah. And was it always the goal in your mind to come back to Singapore, do you think? I don't know if I if I did think about it when I went into it because I thought, you know, what would be what would be my ideal kind of school to work at and definitely this was the kind of place that I thought about. So as luck had it, they, they had just built a new campus, this East Campus that I'm working on, and so I saw that there were opportunities there. So it was it was it was a lot of things that kind of just aligned. Yeah. And one other area I'd love to just dig back in on in your kind of opening there about your background. Do you tap into that background with Norwegian folk music at all now? Or how does that come into your practice? I do. I mean, whether it really like plays a big part in my teaching, I don't know. I mean, as a musician, I've always been very interested in. So the, the music that I write for my own things, I mean, I'm still a... a fairly active performer so the the stuff that I do of my own music uh, is very folk music influenced so I think that my 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 own concept as a musician is very much like a jazz fusion with Norwegian folk music elements mm. I mean, if, if you know ECM that kind of record label it's like that that kind of sounding stuff uh, so I use it a lot for that and I think it, it does give me a kind of an avenue into especially things like music that's learned by ear and kind of how that works uh, and also the considering kind of the element of rhythm in music in, in Norwegian folk music there's quite a lot of quirky sort of rhythms that exist um, and so that sort of opens up a, a different avenue I guess. So we'll talk more about music and for those who are watching this episode you'll see just by where Ivan's located like it's this really cool looking studio with all sorts of gadgets so we'll get back to that but I was really intrigued when I was doing a bit of digging before this this recording about in your title in LinkedIn, which is a, probably a good place to find this sort of stuff, it mentions that you have a passion for service learning and innovation. So I think two questions on that. What drives your passion for service learning? And then maybe, if at all, how do you integrate this passion for service learning into music teaching in your current role? So I think it's a really big driving force for me to be a teacher. You know, one of the reasons I chose to go into education from from music performance as my full-time career was that there's there's a lot of different things about your sense of purpose I think as a teacher that are different I mean there's purpose in all jobs but there's the pur purpose in teaching is so it's very uh, tangible in a sense and so this idea of of helping students see the value of caring for others and kind of understanding what that process is and practicing it is something that I've always been very motivated to do. I think that when it comes to service learning, one of the great things about it is that students wouldn't put themselves into these situations voluntarily all the time. Like, I mean, some, of course, do. Some are driven very early to do it. But for some students, you got to kind of put them in that situation. And then when they're in that situation, they realize this is very rewarding. Like, it makes me feel good about myself. And I, 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 I celebrate that. You know, like, I, I think in, in service learning, we're sometimes a little bit afraid of that patting yourself on the back uh, concept. But um, actually, I think for students, it's like this idea that they feel, yeah, I did something good today. I did something good for other people today. And that makes them feel better about themselves. And then they're driven to do even more of that. Um, that is something that I've always seen as a kind of essential part of teaching that taking students into that kind of environment where they they help others or support others in some kind of way. So for me, the the thing that I have been most 
interested in in that space is uh, is dementia and uh, l- looking after people with dementia. I think one of the things there is that that interaction for students is it, it's it's pretty challenging because it's you you're face to face with something quite that's difficult. It's it's challenging for students to be face to face with with a person with dementia. But there's also something very immediate in terms of the support and the the help and the contribution that you have. I think sometimes in service learning there's you've got to think really big picture, everything is very long term. When you sit with someone with dementia, the only thing you have is that moment for lots of obvious reasons. So you're really just there trying to care for another person, trying to, to, to be good, be polite, be kind to another person. And that and that I think as a learning you know, wh- one thing is obviously that you're helping, trying to support the people with dementia. But as a learning activity, there's also something really, uh, really sort of significant that happens there. So what uh, many, I'm, I'm sure many people that, that listen to or, or follow your podcast would probably be aware of this. But dementia is a really unique thing when it comes to music. So what happens is that when uh, memory deteriorates with dementia, there's a few areas of memory that stay intact for a really, really long time, almost right till the end. And musical memory is one of those things. It just has to do with where it's located in the brain structure, I think. I'm no expert on that, so I'm not going to talk out of, <laughs> out of my own expertise. But the interesting thing that happens is that if you can find the right music for someone with dementia, and it has to be the right music, it has to be the music that's part of their biography. So it means, you know, if you think the music that you listened to when you were a teenager or, you, you know, whatever played at, as the first dance at your wedding, these are the, the milestone pieces of music of your life, of your autobiography. And it has to be those pieces. So those, when, when those pieces are heard, it activates, or basically, it, it's lots of activity starts happening in the brain. And the interesting thing is it triggers other areas to become temporarily activated. So someone with dementia that is, you know, very kind of out of it, you know, doesn't move much, uh, unable to answer kind of simple questions, you play them this uh, bespoke music collection or, or pieces of music like that, it creates this kind of uh, awake. It's, it's sometimes spoken about as a kind of awakening, where they become suddenly much more alert. Uh, they're able to engage in conversation. There's a sort of sense of restoring dignity. It doesn't last for a very long time. It lasts for uh, a couple of minutes, maybe at the time. But then you go back to the music, and you can again create this. It is obviously not. It doesn't have a kind of a, a healing, you know, element to it because no one has a, a cure to dementia. But it does restore dignity in that moment. It allows them to connect more with their caregivers or with their family. Um, it allows them to feel more you know, aware and, and uh, interact with their environment in a different way. And so this is something that we've been really working on for a long time. Uh, so over the last 10 years, we've been going very regularly to a dementia care home and doing this. And so this, this work is uh, is quite uh, time consuming because what happens is that you have to first look at the, the the person with dementia, you have to look at their kind of biography, you have to figure out what music they might have liked because obviously with the, the way the disease, the illness is, you can't necessarily ask the person what music did you listen to you when you were growing up. There are cases when they will remember, but other times they won't be able to tell you. So you have to find out. You have to actually research that. Now, in some cases, the family will be there to answer some of those questions, but more often than not, they are not. So you have to be the detective to figure out what is this person's musical biography. You have to try, do a lot of trial and error where you play pieces of music, you look for a response, then you log what are those pieces, and then you start developing a kind of therapy plan. So most places that deal with dementia care just don't have the capacity to do it. They just don't have the time because it just you have to be so kind of committed to it. So we've done this over years here where we've developed playlists that are kind of catered to a Singaporean Malay speaker born in the 1950s or, you know, those kinds of things. And that's stuff that we've been collecting over time. So that has been a really wonderful thing to see students doing that. Now, a few years ago, we were given some funding from uh, first from the college itself. uh, And later on, we got some funding from uh, Google Data Center here in Singapore to basically pursue creating an, an app 
uh, that would be able to do some of this work and actually take some of the, all that research that we had done to create a more instant um, way to access this this therapy. So we've just finished the app. The app is actually out on in a kind of beta version on Google Play Store right now. It's called Fuxi. It's F U X I. Um, it's an app that is tailor made for Singapore right now. Um, so right now it's it's really only music that is specific to uh, you know the generations born in the 40s, 50s, 60s or, or earlier in Singapore. But it's really uh, some some exciting work is happening there, and that that has been really interesting because we have to innovate by bringing in people from technology. So there's been student there's been student led work where they've done the coding, they built the app. The students that had worked in the dementia care center provided their insights and research. Um, you know, there was a lot of different people involved, and uh, and that was really really exciting. So so we're still working on that, but that has uh, it's really become something bigger than just 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 what we're doing there. We're hoping that eventually this app that we've made is something that we're going to be able to essentially give to the world, and then basically all you need is in any kind of location you need someone that has a basic coding skill set that is able to then localize the app for their context and replace the playlists with music that's relevant to that place and that context. Um, but we're hoping that this is going to keep on giving and, and it will probably be a project that's going to be with us for, for many years to come. That is incredible. Like I was just listening with questions in my mind and you just kept answering them because I was thinking, you know, are the students doing the conversations with the individuals to find these songs and it sounds like yes right they're yeah, going absolutely in and actually, yeah. which i can just imagine seeing that happen like the the energy in the room from both the student but then maybe unlocking some of those songs from the individuals must be such a beautiful process to to witness it is and the the times that it really does work and this is it is like i said it's time consuming work you have to sometimes work with someone for many months before you see any kind of impact sometimes you never see any impact but then when you do really see it and you have someone that's you know really kind of like i said really out of it you know doesn't move much you know very like sort of distant can't interact and then they suddenly they start dancing or they will sing word by word a whole song um, perfectly. Uh, the, all these types of things happen. The, the most funny, actually, experience I think we, we ever had was there was a student that was writing his extended essay on this project. And the student had set up that he was going to work with, there was one resident that we knew, we knew that he uh, knew a couple of Deep Purple songs really well. And so he was going to be kind of playing them on the guitar. And then he was going to see like, you know, if he played the recordings or whether he he performed the song for the resident, you know, whether there was any difference. And it was really funny because he was he hadn't actually prepared that well. The student hadn't prepared that well. So he, he rocks up at the at the care home with his guitar and he's going to play this, this song Soldier of Fortune, this Deep Purple song. And he's messing it all up like he's he <laughs> gets the words wrong and he's doing that. And then the resident starts teaching him the song. Yeah. So he has this this person with dementia is like teaching him how to, you know, the lyrics for, for this Deep Purple song. And, the, you know, there's, there's so many things to unpack about why that was a really beautiful moment. You know, the sense of empowering the person with dementia, giving him the, the, the role of the teacher, in a sense. I mean, something that seems so, so impossible, like with what dementia is. Uh, and it was a really, uh, you know, it, actually just because of the student's kind of poor preparation we got this really magical moment out of it and it was a really wonderful thing it's almost like there could be a model in that you know having a student semi-prepare or or prepare well but then that's part of the preparation is almost to tease out that teaching moment that shared moment of discovery with with the person who's yeah finding i'm probably going to use the wrong terminology here but finding these memories or reinvigorating these memories yeah, that would be so interesting to pursue and see if there's some kind of model in that. Yeah, and and I mean we're we're also working on that because one of the things that if this app works out the way that we hope 
uh, and we're going to try to kind of distribute it uh, to other schools, especially this, this will be something that is mainly like, I think, you know, at first, something that schools can access to create service programs of their own around dementia and music. But we're trying to prepare a kind of package of, you know, based on our experiences, you know, here is how you can kind of you know, set up the activity, here's how, you know, a kind of protocol for how students would work with the person with dementia. And that's a space where we could have, I had never thought of that, but then I might include some something around that, you know, like trying to create interesting scenarios to kind of play around with, to have a bit of fun and, mm -hmm. and that. Cause, and and that, that brings me to the kind of the other thing. Once students uh, are able to have fun in that space. And that is a d difficult thing to do because you go into a dementia care home, you see kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of things that I think you can perceive as kind of human misery around you. To bring like a really positive, excited, humorous energy into that space, that takes a lot of practice. But that's something that also we see with the students that go and they will do this service for at least a year. Some people do it for many years in a row. The ones that have been doing it for a long time, they're able to do that. They come in, they smile, they laugh, they, they're they touching the shoulder of the resident they're working with and playing around and joking and all of that. And that's also a, a kind of a skill, I think, to be able to go into an environment like that and bring positive energy that is uh, and that doesn't come naturally like you got to practice you got to be used to the space you got to have seen it many times and you've got to learn to kind of put on that act when you go in and that's and that's also something i think is really valuable for the students to do i mean it's an amazing sounding project in the show notes for this episode we'll make sure we put the any links or any information you have fuzi yeah, Fusi, yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure we've got information about that. I can imagine people listening to this thinking, I'd love to do something similar or on a, you know, a similar page in this space. And it would be great for people to be able to reach out maybe and learn more about it if they want more specific info. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just, I, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that experience in those moments. It sounds incredible. Okay, well, we might take a bit of a left turn here because we've got lots to chat about. And one of those things that came up in our discussions just before the recording was your role as course designer for this thing called the IB systems transformation pilot. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Can you outline what that is and yeah, how it might relate to music or just how it might be interesting for listeners? So the the IB is uh, making quite a lot of effort to move forward, I think, in their, you know, how their education model, especially in the IB diploma is working. I think, you know, that there's, there's an interesting sort of thing around education where the most amount of innovation always happens with the youngest students. So, you know, if you go into a K1 or K2 classroom or a primary school grade one or two classroom, you'll see so much innovative work, so much innovative teaching and learning and really cutting edge stuff. I mean, the best stuff is happening there. And as students get older, and that's all the way up into tertiary education, uh, it gets less and less flexible, you know, less and less agile. And so the interesting thing is that, of course, the IB diploma sits in a space that's like by nature kind of conservative. You know, people feel like it's high stakes, parents feel it's high stakes, students feel it's high stakes. So that ability to change and move in a different direction is often lacking, I think. And the IB is aware of this and have really tried now to, to move forward with that. So one of the things around this is this is a pilot that is um, only done currently this there's one third college that has joined, but it was Atlantic College, uh, the UWC Atlantic and UWC SEA that were the kind of first uh, s uh, schools to take on this pilot. So we're hoping, of course, that it's going to develop into something that uh, all IB schools will do. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, in a nutshell, the course is a bit different. So it will count as two standard level courses. That's going to mean that students will be able to have a much more flexible IBDP package and still go out with the IB diploma. So this, I think, is really, really good already because uh, in terms of student agency and sort of the flexibility of the program, you know, the IB diploma has been restrictive for some students. Uh, <clears throat> and so that, I think, is a really, <clears throat> a really positive thing. But talking about the course itself, one of the things there is that it's a very kind of transferable skills-based 
course. So it's going to be a project-based learning course. So the students pursue projects, and those projects become the space for the for the learning of the different skills. Now, the Atlantic model and our model are slightly different in terms of the skill sets that they focus on. But the big picture of it is that it's a kind of change maker course and the idea that you know that in order to create change you have to have a set, set of skills you have to practice those and that's the kind of the, that's the premise of the course now how does this relate to music i'll get to in a second but i think that the important thing here is that we look to the future and we see a future that is that it is ever changing, right? Like technology and all these different things, the world of work, these are things that are continuously changing and probably changing faster now than ever before. And how do you equip students with skills that they're actually going to need for that? So for us, for the course that we're doing, we're looking at systems thinking skills and project management skills, leadership skills, and a few other things, design thinking. And uh, the idea here is that students learn those skills through the projects, and that becomes the kind of the big outcome of the learning. Um, so students can essentially choose any area where they see uh, something that needs a change or they want to kind of investigate something where they feel like, like change needs to happen. And then that can turn into a project that's sometimes more hypothetical, but very often it should be something where you're actually engaging with partners and trying to 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 do something that's going to change change the world for for better whether that's a s small thing or the big thing that's you know there's something there but the thing is because it's multidisciplinary by design there's going to be space here for students to kind of think about who they are and what they want to do with their lives and then create projects around that so you can see very much a music student or a theater student or an art student thinking about you know how how can we create positive change through the arts and then they can make that their project so the project you'd still be thinking about the systems and you'd be thinking about you know leverage points and you'd be thinking about what kind of design thinking process you're going to use but the project itself could be something about community art making for instance or it could be this like music and dementia thing that we're doing could be an example of something that could be that or it could be you know creating teaching resources for kids in terms of learning music or or diversity you could do diversity in music you could do some project around creating more awareness of diversity issues in music or you could create concerts with intentionally diverse programs um you know and and doing a, a concert of uh, of uh, you know music all written by women for for instance, there's, there's, there's tons of things like that that you could still do because the basis of the learning is is in the skill sets that you would apply. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of the, the teaching element of it would be about teaching that. So protocols for systems thinking and systems mapping of a problem and design thinking, the fact that you, you know, in order to pursue a project like this, you have to kind of go through several stages. And we're learning from things like the tech industry in terms of that, uh, lots of different, you know, great resources on that. So the idea is, you know, you get these transferable skills, but at the same time, you get to also pursue the learning that is really important to you. And that could, you know, and we're talking about it now in an arts context because that's our conversation right now. But equally, you could you could do this course if you wanted to focus on learning things about uh, medicine or if you wanted to focus on something to do with sustainability and the environment. Yeah. Or you could want to pursue something around peace building or, uh, you know, like so. So there's this whole, you know, the skill sets in terms of subjects and all of that all could mix into this. And and again, as I talk about it, I know it sounds vague. It isn't vague. It is actually just that it's really complex. So the uh, you know, the course is complex by design and so it takes a while to to sort of really explain, but it's it's robust, you know, and it's the design of it is robust. It's not like, oh, what should we do? We could do anything. It's not that. It's something really targeted, really specific, you know, really has taken into account what the world of work and the future of kind of different industries needs and that's been the design of it so anyone that wants to learn more about that too please get in touch because we'd love to tell you and i think even on the ib website or i think i googled it quite simply like ib systems transformation pilot and there was some information already there so that could be a starting point and then they could go to you who is actually in the space testing this this new concept right yeah, exactly. And we're writing the course ourselves as we go, but the IB is, you know, very much we're, it's in close collaboration with the IB and it's really it's really interesting to see them 
being very innovation focused, I think. And that's, you know, that the IB has a long history and I don't know if they've always been so innovative, but I, I feel like they're really turning in a different direction in the last couple of years in terms of their curriculum design. And that's really exciting for all of us, the schools that obviously are tied to the to the IB and that is the programs that we follow. It's it's very positive to see the IB going in that direction and in, in a very kind of purposeful way uh, and, and starting to really maybe play around with the stru overall structure of the courses and, and thinking about making it more flexible, having more student agency, having, a, you know, a different set of skills maybe. Yeah, really exciting. I think we could probably chat about this concept a lot more. I've got a bunch of questions, but I think we might leave it there in that I want to talk more about music stuff very specifically, but I do love these conversations, these interviews exactly for this reason. Like so far we've talked about service learning and the incredible impact that you guys have made in that extended program there using music as kind of the tool. And now even with this new, this new course that's being piloted, there's such an amazing application for music there. And I think for music educators, as we're thinking about future focused music education and thinking like, what is it going to look like? How are we going to shift our programs to, to reflect what's happening in the world of music? These kinds of conversations are really inspiring, but I want to jump on the back of that because at the in the intro I mentioned this conversation that I kind of just sat in on. I was there almost like as a spectator, but just loving it. You and Samuel Wright, well, Samuel Wright was hosting this conversation for MTIS, and we had I don't know. I think there was a few people, maybe five or six people online, and we're all discussing um, some music technology pathways ideas that Samuel often speaks about and it's a really cool concept in itself. But you guys got chatting and you were speaking about this, what I remember as a music technology kind of immersion for grade nine and 11, I later remembered. Can you outline a bit about what this is, this music technology immersion thing? Why are you doing it firstly, maybe? And what does it look like? What does it, what does it mean to you? So there's a couple of background things that I think are important to put in place there. So one of the things was that with the new IB DP course, I mean, that was one of the first sort of spaces where Samuel and I connected. We, we did a lot of work when that new course came out to try to help uh, different teachers kind of navigate what was a much more kind of open-ended and flexible course than the one that had come before it. And also it was during COVID, so like a lot of schools were really kind of like struggling to adapt to that. So we started working quite closely with the IB there to sort of bring that out. So we did a bunch of different workshops. We created sort of exemplar materials. There was a whole bunch of different things that we did during that time. So the first sort of thing was, was this exploration of that new course that has obviously a music technology component in it. So we knew, okay, there's something there. We're looking for, for ways to, to incorporate that. But the other thing that goes along with it was that our school, UWCSEA, uh, decided to start phasing out the GCSE, which is what they've uh, been doing for grades 9 and 10, <clears throat> and replace it with our own curriculum that we wrote from scratch. And that's every department. This is a massive project, a massive undertaking. Lots of time and resources has gone into it because literally every department plus a few extra because there was obviously... Uh, teachers that said, well, we don't have this course currently, but we should. And so, you know, there was a lot of that that happened. So um, for our 910 uh, course, we were essentially given a blank slate and said, whatever you want to do, go and do it. Mm. And that was very exciting. And we we knew that this music technology, you know, it, obviously, every you know, most music teachers realize that you you need to incorporate that in some way. It's so relevant. It's so exciting. There's so many new things happening with that. So we thought, okay, this kind of aligns in a way because there's music technology in 11 and there's music technology that we want to bring into this 910 course. And then we decided to focus it on basically, the, so it's it, it, it runs for a different amount of weeks depending, I think. So it's not a set amount of weeks. Sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 12 weeks. Uh, that depends a little bit on the calendar. But we chose to focus on the element of performing with music te technology rather than composing. I think that composing with music technology is pretty accessible to to most students and teachers. It's not, it doesn't take, um, you know, you, you just get in there, you find a software, you start playing around. You know, it's very, a lot of it is intuitive and then you mm -hmm. can teach the skills through that. 
music performance with technology is more tricky because it's there's other things to consider. There's you know the hardware. I mean, just before we started the the podcast, now we were talking about this. You know the 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 tactile element of of all these different devices. You know, you see some here in the back, like you know this this. Uh, there's something about that that's really powerful. And that's something that I think students are a little bit more, you know, they, they're more hesitant to kind of explore unless they're put into a situation where they kind of have to do it. So we decided to kind of invest in some some equipment and we kind of used what we had. So like loop pedals are a great thing. That's a, that's a really powerful one. Um, you know, things like drum machines or any other kind of like launch pad type thing. And then incorporating that into performance. So, you know, you might be playing live on your guitar while having a launch pad, or you might be singing and using a loop pedal to record that while you still have some other kind of elements of technology happening. So this... This kind of the the immersion that you're that you're talking about there was very focused on that. It was very focused on performance rather than composing. So you know, so that that was very interesting. So the final presentation of this music technology work happens in something that we've called Music Tech Night. That's actually what you see on the screen behind me as the as the recording of that event. And in that event, we decided to make it a kind of very safe space for trial and error. So we didn't invite a lot of people from outside. It was mainly the students that are in the course. Um, that way they can kind of, you know, with, with performing with technology, you're always going to have a, some glitches here and there. And the idea of just being able to just start again and, and do it one more time was something that we thought was quite attractive. But we still set it up, as you can see, with lighting. And we had some good uh, camera work in terms of getting a recording of it. One of the most exciting things that happened with this was that we decided, okay, with music technology, you know, sound and audio quality is a really big part of it. And how do we ensure that like all these complex setups with loop pedals and computers and samplers and all of this stuff is going to really work? And we thought, well, putting everybody on headphones in the audience would be an ideal sort of way. I mean, you see that, you watch those like snarky puppy videos and all of that, you know, you see see this this idea of being an audience, but having the audio in headphones is something that can be quite cool. Now, it was, a, it was kind of lucky things that came together because during COVID, in order for us to keep, continue our singing ensembles, we had a setup going where basically every practice room was connected to the studio through uh, through headphones and the the students could join a Zoom call, but you'd have the live audio. I mean, everyone's tried to do audio rehearsals through Zoom knows that that can be a bit of a disaster. So the, the the visual was in Zoom, but the sound was actually feeding straight through the studio. So we had all this equipment to allow for basically many, many headphones to be connected to the same system. And so that's what we did. So we basically ran the mixer. We had 50, I think an audience of 50 people, all with their individual set of headphones listening to the performance. So if you, if you came into that room when those performances were happening, you'd see all these people and you'd see people playing instruments, but it was dead quiet. Like <laughs> there, was, there was no sound in the room virtually at all. But, you know, like you can see, we did, we, we'd still still did it all up with the with lights and and everything like that and we made it into a really a, a big event in terms of that so for the students i think that that was a really uh, exciting learning opportunity and i think you could recreate that even if you didn't have as much facilities we i mean we we were lucky we were very well resourced here uh, but i think you could do a lot of things that would be similar again if you take out that kind of the, the component of the outside kind of audience coming in you know there's a lot of things you can do in terms of experimenting and trial, trying things out. And then, of course, as you develop it, you could take it to a bigger audience as well. Mm. But I, I quite like that that idea of doing something like this that you know feels like is a bit of risk to the students. But then you create a space where you're like, there's no risk because we're just, we're making an event out of it, but we're not necessarily, in this case, inviting everyone from the community to come. We're keeping it a little bit more closed off and that in this particular instance i think that was quite good because there were a few people that had kind of st start and stop and, and and things like that but they got to kind of take it through and do the performance and this is the starting point for many of the performers we see that are using music tech for performance are using loop pedals are using any kind of triggering device they all have to go through that process of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. They might just do it in their studio a thousand times before they perform on stage. Or in the case of a gig I saw a couple of weeks ago, which is an artist called Younger, Y-O-U-N-G with an R, 
full live performance with drum machines and all sorts of triggering stuff and loop pedals. He had the 505, you know, five looper device, the desk mounted one. And this is a live performance that we're all paying money for. And there was a moment where it didn't quite happen and the looping didn't work. So he had to, he's got a drum kit live on stage. He had to jump on the drums while his sound tech came and twiddled some cables, played drums for everyone, kept the audience going, everything started again, and he went back into it. But that's the process that your students are going through by the sounds of it in this, this immersive experience, which is really cool. Exactly. And I think that, that, that it is that, I mean, all music teachers, are, you know, have an awareness of this, but it's that the kind of the, the staggering or, or, you know, the step by step sort of process of how do you become comfortable performing and working in front of an audience. And we've got to create a scaffolded way for students to experience that at increasing levels of, you know, like, attention in a sense right like so you know you you'll have your students that definitely you know i mean we re recently just took our students off campus into one of the the concert spaces here the kind of national concert spaces for a performance and so that was a really kind of truly professional kind of experience with a professional sound crew from from that that venue and you know with all the parents coming in and a full house of that and that's one way of experiencing performance and i think that's really valuable but there's many steps leading up to that and i think you know working that into your curriculum having some opportunities where you invite a lot of people in and some where you don't i mean you know this is the all all music teachers do do this but it's mm. it's worth pointing out again you know like just even though it's familiar stuff that, that there's great value in in setting up that kind of structure yeah could you take us a little bit more through this curriculum that you guys have designed year nine ten right you said you had the blank slate yep. What else is going on in that in that curriculum? It might be interesting for some of the listeners to hear, maybe for some inspiration for their own. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure I can remember every unit of work. Give us your favorite one, even like one of your favorite units. Yeah, so I think I, what, one of the favorites that we're doing right now <clears throat> is around uh, music for for games, so gaming music, and that's been really exciting. We had someone build a kind of very basic computer game. It's one of those kind of like, you know, you, you jump up and down and you try to sort of get to a certain stage and there's obstacles in the way that you have to kind of jump over or whatever. Um, they're very much like, it looks like, you know, the, the old Nintendo games. You know, like, like a Mario kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that, that type of game. But um, the person that designed the game for us, actually, it, interestingly, one of our percussion teachers who happens to also do a side gig of, you know, working for Google, <laughs> Google, um, he as just as a favor to us, he, he he created this this game. He said it didn't take him that long, apparently. And there's basically a setup where you can put the audio in for so there's like a menu. There's a, so there's music for the menu. There's music for the main gameplay, and then there's sounds for different things like you're picking up a coin, or you know like when you fall down or whatever. There's like some sounds for that, and so this allows the students to kind of play the game, and then. They go back and kind of create their own concept for what they want that music to be like. Once they work on it in Logic or GarageBand or whatever, and you uh, bounce out some MP3s of those sound files, and you just drop them in, and then suddenly you can play the game with your own music that you designed, and then you, you get that kind of playing experience. So that's been really exciting. And actually, interestingly, we have also been doing a lot of that kind of work with the Contemporary Music Maker, which is the IBDP kind of more project-based component. Mm. So this, uh, this year, for instance, two students, they chose to focus on that area and created really quite... And of course, with, with this one, with the CMM, they did a lot more complex games, so games that have a lot of layers and a lot of different levels to it and all that kind of stuff. But that, that's been really exciting. I think that's music for games is really exciting because I think it's where some of the greatest art making of this time period is really happening. You know, it's all the visuals, it's all the, the art, it's, it's, you know, it's really like it's, it's the most, one of the most relevant spaces for kind of artistic expression that exist right now and students are interested in that and excited with that but we've tried to combine it with other skills you know we it's obviously good to be try to be kind of cutting edge and and be very sort of forward lean into sort of technology and things but you know there's a lot to be said about very the more sort of traditional skill sets too uh, and so one of the things that we did which was also really exciting was that we did a, un a unit that was all about string quartet 
writing, writing arrangements for a string quartet, taking your favorite piece, writing it for a string quartet. We taught the skill sets of, of that and kind of looked at, you know, how do you harmonize and the roles the different instruments can play, texture, contrast, all that kind of stuff. And then we got a, a string quartet of professional musicians in and the students gave them their music and they had to sight read it. Uh, basically so there was you know we didn't give the string quartet much time for preparation mm. so one of the parts of the brief was you have to write music that is playable when you sight read it because then we said you know like because if you think about you know what do composers do like you know what are people that are composing doing a lot of people that compose are writing music for school bands or you know for <clears throat> beginner musicians or they're writing for an ensemble where perhaps not everybody is you know as skilled as the other person or whatever so this idea that as a composer that is going to put your music like physically in the hands of of people that play instruments you have to take all of that into account you can't just write you know what you hear you've got to actually think who's going to be playing this what can they manage how much time are they going to have to prepare for it and then you work that into it as well and i think that that was really that was quite an eye opening thing for students because i think some of the most successful pieces in that context were not the most advanced students because those students went way too ambitious and wrote something impossible and it was just kind of you know, potentially like a bit of a train wreck i mean luckily i think our string players managed to to make the most of it but it was the pieces of those students that perhaps at the beginning thought i don't know if i can do this this is very intimidating this seems like a pretty scary thing and you know i play the guitar and i've never dealt with string music i don't read music that well for instance but they actually had really successful outcomes because they'd written something that was just clean and to the point and uh you know like just musically very very to, yeah to the point so yeah playable <laughs> playable yeah so that that i think is an interesting skill set that's a really great way to do it and the real world application of the composition concept comes in there as well because like you said I'm just imagining composition tasks that I've done in the past. And if it doesn't have a necessarily strong real world application, you get, you know, everything's semi quavers or 16th notes. And there's like weird rests everywhere. And you're like, hang on, do you think anyone can actually play this? But the kid loves the sound of it. That's cool, but it's not playable. So I love that concept. And I remember recently in a podcast with Dimo, Dimitra Koulakos, he does a similar thing. Um, and being in Luxembourg, he's got access to these fantastic musicians locally. And he's, he's done a similar thing with his grade sevens. I like this idea. And I think it would be really cool to hear this happening more because it does make so much sense in terms of it actually having a, a real world outcome. Love it. Yeah. And I think for, for teachers that listen to this, you know, that might want to do the same and they think, well, we don't have the resource to get a bunch of professional musicians in. I actually think, to me, the most valuable thing is this idea of it being playable. So you just change the brief slightly. You say, this is going to be written for these four string players that are in our class. Or if yes. they're not string players, you know, the two trumpets and, uh, and an electric guitar and whatever, right? That, but you're writing for those specific people. It's like here you have a person with a skill set that can do this well and that isn't so familiar with this, that maybe learns, you know, by ear a bit or whatever, you know, whatever profile this you have of that notes, musician. You know, even a range, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then and then that, that idea, I mean, that's, you know, in the music, uh, you know, in the history of music, that's, that's something that's happened a lot. You know, I mean, you look, there's a lot of famous concertos, for instance, that were written for specific musicians. And so they are written to be perfect in terms of technical challenge for that person that was going to play it. Um, and so it's a, it's a very, it's a very interesting sort of skill set to explore that I think, you know, that we don't spend enough time thinking about, actually, because we just get kind of absorbed in just a very theoretical sense of what music is. And actually, when you get that kind of practical, very individual and targeted way of making music, it actually becomes much more fun. Mm. Ivan, thank you so much for exploring these areas. I feel like we've covered three main areas and I'll try and make that clear in the show notes so people have access to some of these ideas or at least a way to ask you more questions if they want. But I really appreciate it. I think in the interest of time, we're going to leave it there. But before we do, is there anything else you want to say? Any other thoughts, ideas, uh, things you want to share before we wrap up? 
I think the main thing is just again, just as I said at the beginning, just to to applaud the the work that you're doing. And I think I, if anything, I want to encourage all the international music teachers to to connect with with you and to connect with your the the work that you're doing. Um, and really, you know, if we can create a really strong community, all of those of us that are that are doing this kind of work, I think everybody's going to benefit from it. So so keep doing what you're doing, and to all your listeners, please. Keep an eye on what Chris is doing and uh, and join his uh, his many excellent workshops as well. We had some of our our teachers join your workshop up in KL um, some so I guess a m- month or two ago. Uh, really, really pleased with the, what what was happening there as well. So just want to put that out there to all to everybody that uh, that there's lots of great opportunities coming up and more and more every every day it seems. So well done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, again. Anything that we've talked about, we'll try and make sure we we tidy this up and have info for everyone to jump in on. Ivan, thanks again so much for the time and all the best for the year ahead. It's uh you know coming up to the end of the school term as as we're recording this, so I'm sure you're probably ready for a holiday. <laughs> but again, I just really appreciate your time and for sharing all these insights with us, and I think they're going to be really valuable. Thanks so much, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be on. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting mtiis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for Music Teachers in International Schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E-L-M-A. See you next time.